just um, take our seats. Uh, welcome to day two of State of the Net. Um, today we're going to focus on uh, bandwidth constraints, uh, new media services, entertainment in the cloud, and the like. And we have two morning keynotes this morning. We have, um, I'll introduce them in kind. Um, we're very fortunate that uh, Jared Polis, Congressman Jared Polis is with us today. He represents the second congressional district of Colorado. Um, the congressman, in a former life, has, has co-founded and founded several companies, uh, including Blue Mountain Arts um, and, and ProFlowers.com. Um, he, Ernst and Young, has um, called him Entrepreneur of the Year um, on, on occasion. And um, he, he serves on the Powerful Rules Committee in, in the Congress. And um, I don't know if it's uh, a fortuitous timing, but uh, in December he was appointed to the Judiciary Committee um, just in time for um, the SOPA debate. So, uh, Congressman Jared Polis, welcome. I heard that you uh, you haven't heard anything about SOPA or piracy yet in this in this uh, in this conference. Um, what I thought I'd do, since uh, I have a little time here, I, I certainly want to uh, take any questions you have. But I thought I would briefly go over uh, my thoughts on some of the items on your agenda. Um, I'm happy to focus, um, you know, in particular on on piracy if that happens to be the. Uh, the topic is your, but I want to cover some of the other things as well that um, are being talked about uh, today. Um, I certainly know that one of the things you talked about is uh, online sales tax should Congress weigh in. I think that's coming up actually later today. Um, certainly a hot topic. I think uh, inevitably there needs to be uh, some, uh, when you're looking at gathering taxes, uh, you want to do it in a way that distorts the economy minimally. Um, I'm not a fan of sales taxes generally. Um, so, I, for instance, there's a, a proposal called the fair tax that actually abolished the income tax and moved to a strictly sales tax system. I actually tend to think we should go the other way. Um, I think that as states look into it, uh, it becomes harder and harder to figure out who should and shouldn't pay a sales tax. I think that um, income and property taxes uh, are better ways uh, to, uh, to gather revenue with minimal distortions to the economy than a sales tax because it always becomes a question of who you apply the sales tax to. And uh, in an increasingly complex world, you have multiple jurisdictions that want to charge a sales tax. It becomes very difficult. Another topic, I think this one's from yesterday, geolocation, the Jones case, and the reasonable expectation of, of privacy. Uh, obviously, with new technology, um, it creates uh, new uh, uh, opportunities for custom customized experiences. And of course, the flip side is uh, uh, privacy. Now, I think that. Uh, many, you know, what we have is kind of a general generational shift in, in, in usage of technology. And I think many um, people who are comfortable with technology, who are kind of digital natives, have different expectations about what, what privacy means um, than uh, people who are just adapting to uh, the new technologies. Now, I think what's clear is the consumer has to be in charge, but most consumers you will find, particularly consumers who are digital natives, are very happy to uh, give up much of their privacy in exchange for a customized experience that takes up less of their time. Um, you know, for instance, to see advertisements that are of some remote interest to them or targeted to them rather than something that's not relevant at all, to see a special or a coupon or savings from a store that's located near where they are uh, versus uh, across the country or across town. So um, again, the key thing is that uh, people want to be in charge of their own uh, information, but uh, many people um, in particular are more than happy to make that uh, transaction and in effect uh, sell some of their information, uh, particularly aggregate information, uh, to those who would provide them a superior user experience based on that. Um, another one uh, that we talked that I guess has been talked about is uh, communications content regulation and Reno versus the ACLU case and some of its uh, implications. Um, again, I think we are moving towards a freer and freer uh, communications uh, infrastructure. Um, there's really uh, limited ability uh, to, to regulate. Obviously, there's an issue of um, you know what's available, uh, where, and, and and what can be protected from schools, uh, you know, from kids and so forth. Uh, and again, I think this is uh, handled well by the private sector uh, and really needs to be handled in each household. Uh, it's a very hard thing to to. Uh, to regulate, um, but obviously, uh, as a you know new parent, I'll be you know he's only four months old now. He doesn't use the internet, but as he grows up, certainly it'll be my responsibility to ensure that uh, that's supervised and we have uh, the right uh, filtering software if appropriate. But uh, but even better, just to provide that personal 
uh, oversight into uh, what he is and isn't doing on the, uh, on the internet. Uh, patents uh, have also been discussed, and, and I think Congress kind of, we, we, missed, a, we missed a major opportunity at, at, uh, at, at helping to create a, a patent system for the 21st century. Uh, just a few months ago, we, we passed a few very minor uh, changes that don't really affect this particular uh, balance one way or the other. Um, but uh, unfortunately, the way Congress works, I think most in Congress think we've kind of, they kind of list patent reform in, in the done category, and it'll be hard to talk about it for another decade here. So, uh, you know, what we saw, you know, moving to first to invent, um, perhaps some changes at the Patent and Trademark Office, having an ability to kind of challenge post-issue and have it adjudicated, you know, with, with a patent um, administra administratively. These are very minor things. Um, I think fundamentally the issue is, is that we still have a patent system that is uh, pre sort of built on the mechanical era rather than the digital and biological era. And uh, it's time to, uh, to really uh, rethink what intellectual pro property protection does mean and should mean uh, in this new age. Um, I think what we currently do can probably continue to look, uh, exist alongside it for mechanical innovations, which certainly still exist and it seems to work fine for, uh, for fundamentally uh, mechanical or physical innovations. But we do need to think of what our intellectual property protection framework should be uh, for the digital and biological area. And that's never been a discussion that Congress has had. Maybe that's a good thing. Um, some kind of Congress has discussions, it's always not the best. But instead, it's basically been left to the administrative branch and the judicial branch. Uh, judicial branch through you know, a hodgepodge of different precedents has, has tried to make the 1913 framework work. Uh, and of course, administratively, the patent office has done whatever they can to try to apply and use their hopelessly uh, outmoded statutes and, and overworked uh, and understaffed uh, offices to provide as, as good services uh, as, as they can with regard to that. Um, finally, getting to um, piracy and and, uh, and and SOPA and so forth, um, you know, today of course being a fascinating day, many many websites have blacked out in protest of SOPA. Uh, what we hope is happening, what I hope is happening, is this is actually generating calls to members of Congress's offices. We, uh, I, I believe it is. I haven't heard from my office yet this morning on this, but uh, you know, my my district is a suburban district in Colorado, and we have received already. The hundreds of contacts uh, against SOPA um, and PIPA, uh, and actually no constituents have contacted us asking us to pass this bill. So that's that's unusual. Um, you know, typically it's more balanced. When we had health care reform, we had you know a lot of constituents even more contact us, but they were evenly split between the four and against side. We've had uh, no uh, constituents asking me to support these uh, bills. Uh, and many, many uh, constituents asking me to oppose them. They are uh, poorly construed in that not only will they not put an end uh, to piracy, uh, they, uh, the collateral damage that they cause uh, can destroy jobs, destroy innovation, uh, you know, damage the, the infrastructure of the internet itself. Um, piracy is a real problem. I tend to support uh, in fact, I'm a co-sponsor of, and I think the correct answer is more along the lines of the Open Act, which is really a follow the money approach. Um, we should have potential trade implications for countries that uh, either don't or refuse to uh, enforce copyright within their borders. But a, multi a multilateral approach is critical uh, for copyright enforcement. Um, the internet by its very nature is, is multilateral. Uh, and uh, a firewall, nation state internet uh, of any form, uh, whether for IP pretenses or for political pretenses, as China has, is uh, not uh, the best uh, route to do that. Um, this uh, SOPA also uh, leaves um, enormous, gives enormous power to our Attorney General's office uh, and the U.S. government. We've already seen other foreign governments like Russia uh, abuse uh, these types of powers. Russia, uh, of course, had a selective enforcement action against various NGOs that they were critical of under the pretense that they had pirated copies of Windows, which no doubt they did, but it turns out so did everybody else in Russia. Uh, and of course, uh, they weren't being prosecuted, so they went after 
uh, a selective group of NGOs they were critical of, and of course Microsoft did the right thing and gave a blanket license to all NGOs saying they're no longer in violation of our intellectual property. They have a blanket license so you can no longer raid them under the pretense of violating uh, intellectual property protocols. Um, so those are some of the issues as I see it. Um, I, I don't think I addressed all of the issues that you have, but I mostly wanted to see what's on your minds and what you would like to hear from the Hill. Uh, I understand you had one of my colleagues from across the aisle, Mr. Goodlock, here yesterday uh, who gave some perspective on some of these issues, uh, and I'd be happy to, uh, to uh, give the other side or fill in the blanks and whatever else I can help with. So with that, we'll open it up. There's a microphone in the middle. Hi, Congressman. This is Juliana Grunwald with National Journal. As you well know, uh, Chairman Lamar Smith yesterday said that he's going to resume his markup uh, in February on SOPA. What do you expect to happen between now and then? I mean, he's, he's uh, given in on the uh, website blocking provision. What else would you like to see happen before then? What do you expect to happen before then? Thank you. Well, we don't know what will happen before then. Uh, we have several um, uh, conflicting pieces of intelligence. The majority leader, Mr. Cantor, uh, has said that he will not bring this bill to the floor uh, until there is consensus, uh, whatever that might mean. Presumably it would mean uh, that some of the opponents today would have to be brought into the fold and changes would have to be made accordingly. Uh, but of course, uh, Mr. Cantor is not the, the chair of the committee, so something can be reported out of committee uh, and not brought to the floor as well. It's a fairly common occurrence across here. Uh, the chairman of the committee has indicated he plans to proceed with the markup, but I think we all expect an additional manager's amendment before the markup. Now, we probably will only see that about 48 hours before the markup, so we have no idea what that might entail. Uh, we had heard, in fact, many of them had claimed that they had already eliminated DNS blocking from the bill, and the previous manager's amendment did that. However, it did not. Uh, there's many other sections of the bill that I'm concerned about, the broad immunities granted in Section 105, the vast power for the Attorney General's office, and when I had the opportunity to question Attorney General Holder about this very issue, uh, he essentially admitted that they would have to use selective enforcement in enforcing that, because as we all know, there are millions or hundreds of millions of incidental copyright violations on this thing that we know as the Internet, and obviously the Attorney General's office absent, uh, you know, hundreds of billions of dollars of staffing would be unable to prosecute all those, and uh, he indicated that he would have to use those powers selectively. So there's a number of issues with the bill, and I don't know which ones will be fixed, and we probably won't know until about 48 hours before that markup, and uh, we, I, I, along with others, will then hopefully work on amendments to try to address some of the remaining issues with the bill at that point. Hi, Congressman. My name is Don Blumenthal with the Public Interest Registry. And I also used to be in internet law enforcement for another uh, three-letter agency. Um, I mention that because I'm very intrigued by the Open Act, but I'm curious how well the International Trade Commission, uh, how much they're in a position to do traditional law enforcement type work. Uh, should it all be with them, or are they going to be ramped up? Uh, well, uh, you know, Law enforcement work versus, uh, you know, civil enforcement of, of, of copyright uh, and penalties for those who don't. Um, there's a law enforcement component to combating piracy, but it's not uh, the main vehicle to combat it. The main one is civil liability. Um, uh, so I, I, I don't think that the um, law enforcement approach so a strictly law enforcement approach has worked or would work, um, certainly with regards to the internet or, um, you know, a, a certainly uh, incidental uh, violations. Um, if you really want to get the attention of companies, um, civil litigation um, and civil liability uh, are the best way to do that. With regard to Open Act and, and an international approach, um, what some critics say who I think miss the point is that it would take forever, it's way too slow, you know, there's no response on a particular site or taking something down. And, and that part is, is correct. And, and, and anybody, the, the goal of an enforcement action should not be just taking down one particular site. As everybody should know, uh, the internet is much like a hydra. You can certainly take one down and two others will, will pop up. That should not be the goal of any enforcement action. That's also the problem with a law enforcement approach. It kind of goes after a particular violator. Uh, when uh, you know you take one down and, and others arise, 
Um, the correct answer is more of a systemic approach, looking at what type of sanctions would be in order for countries that uh, refuse to enforce or, or fail to enforce uh, copyright adequately within their jurisdiction, uh, where they have the ability uh, to enforce those. Um, I think we have a fine balance in the United States of America. Uh, Digital Millennial Copyrights Act, uh, I think, struck a good balance between rights holders and innovation. Uh, when there's infringing content on a website, uh, notice is sent. There's an opportunity for a counter notice. There's an opportunity to remedy that. The whole site isn't taken down. The infringing content is taken down. Uh, it works relatively well. Uh, an internationalized uh, Digital Millennial Copyrights Act uh, with, again, a civil um, uh, liability uh, side, I think, would be a, a more effective way to go after internet piracy than certainly strictly a law enforcement approach, uh, as well as a uh, SOPA approach, uh, which is kind of blocking entire entities or websites uh, who seem to be thought of as pirates. There <coughs> are so many provisions in SOPA that I think are counterproductive. One of them that we didn't get to this amendment, and if it's still in there, I'll still be offering it, but it might be something they remove, I don't know, has this concept of labeling uh, individuals as notorious uh, infringers and sort of somehow blacklisting them from the internet itself um, or doing everything under their power to do that. And, and uh, what, what, again, this is something that fails to kind of understand the culture or sociological significance of the internet. I can guarantee you if there's, you know, somebody sitting in, you know, Vladivostok toiling in obscurity and, and, and pirating money and, uh, you know, making it illegal living at that now, if the United States names him a notorious character, he will receive, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars of support and love letters from across the internet, only helping his bid to uh, engage in piracy. Um, just as we saw with, of course, uh, WikiLeaks, the bane of the U.S. government and so many others, and we have seen uh, much grassroots money flow to that in large part because of its notoriety. So the last thing we want to do is create notoriety uh, among uh, pirates uh, because uh, it only aids and abets their uh, ability to, to take intellectual property. Another question, Congressman? Uh, thanks, Congressman. Wendy Seltzer with uh, Yale Law School Information Society Project. I've, I've really appreciated uh, your advocacy for balance here. Uh, and you, of course, know that there are hundreds of people and thousands of websites blacking out today. Um, do you have suggestions on what we can do going forward between now and the markups on these bills to uh, help your colleagues understand the, uh, the range of opposition to, to these bills? I, I think that again, and, and I've, I've looked at it, I went on this morning, many of these sites are directing people to call their members. I fully expect that mem every member of Congress will receive many calls on this. That's good because it gets this issue on their radar, hey, this is a controversial bill. Most members of Congress will then um, avoid trying to take positions on something that has this level of controversy. So they'll kind of leave it out there hoping that it doesn't, they don't have to take a position, that's, <laughs> that it doesn't come before them. Obviously judiciary, uh, it'll be a little bit uh, quicker. I think the key thing will be is we'll need to react to how these bills change. Uh, we don't know what uh, in the House the chairman uh, has in store uh, for the markup. We don't know how he'll be modifying the bill. We don't know in the Senate uh, how the bill uh, will be brought to the floor or if the, what the manager's amendment will contain. <laughs> Um, and, uh, you know, but the public interest needs to be ongoing. It can't just be a flash uh, uh, in, in the night. Um, and I think it, it's, it's etched itself in the minds of so many uh, people who enjoy the Internet and users who use the Internet, obviously the technological companies as well, uh, helping to facilitate their communications with members of Congress, um, that hopefully that's the case. Uh, I think there's a cover article in the New York Times today, in fact, and kind of they said this is kind of the first example of the internet, you know, waking up politically, and it really is. There's, um, I've never seen this level of interest in a public policy issue uh, from uh, users of the internet across the country and across the world. I um, did a uh, Ask Me Anything on Reddit the other day, and there's a lot of frustration from residents of other countries saying, what can I do to, you know, lobby? I, and I, I had to respond, no, there's really nothing you can do to lobby a congressperson. What you can do is try to ensure that your own politicians are better educated on this issue, that you educate your members of parliament, whether you're in Holland or uh, whether you're in Australia. Uh, and I think if there had been more education of our members of Congress before this point, we wouldn't be at this point either. So uh, it's come to this point. Uh, I think members of Congress are aware that this is a controversial issue. Uh, and uh, generally, members of Congress want to avoid controversial issues. Congressman, do you have time for another couple questions? Sure. Uh, hi, Congressman. Larry Downs. Uh, thank you, by the way, again, for your continued uh, leadership on, on SOPA. 
I'm just sort of curious if you have um, a more proactive agenda that you'd like to see Congress pursue maybe after the election. Uh, are there things that you think the government could do effectively to help the internet economy, whether it's in basic research, whether it's in infrastructure, uh, FCC reform, uh, education? Are there sort of, you know, if you got pet projects you think that would be very helpful that you would like to see move forward? Sure. I mean, one that, again, I, I, I might devote some time to just to kind of scope out the intellectual framework, but I don't expect to move legislatively anytime soon, is one I referred to earlier, which is fixing our patent system, sort of coming up with a patent system for uh, the digital and biological era in the 21st century. Um, some thought needs to be done on that. I'm happy to start uh, that process more uh, imminently. A couple of things that you've mentioned. Um, I happen to be, I'm a supporter of uh, net neutrality. I think that's consistent with a free and open internet, just as uh, stopping bills like SOPA is. Uh, and uh, I will continue to support that. I think uh, the, the rulemaking process um, at the FCC has you know, come to a reasonable balance on that issue as well. Uh, and this is a uh, potential problem that needs to be monitored. And if, in fact, uh, there are privately firewalled internets, um, that can be just as problematic as government firewalled internets. Um, this has not been any large problem to date. But uh, if we see uh, the direction uh, moving towards uh, tiered pricing and selective uh, access to the end user, um, that's something that I would want to be wary of as well. Um, the internet taxation issue obviously needs some more discussion as well. I, I'm generally opposed to kind of precipitous efforts to jump towards uh, taxing transactions. But yes, there's a real issue there. And again, one solution would be states can simply move away from sales tax as a source of revenue. It seems to me that's the easiest one. But if they insist on using it, uh, we have to figure out exactly how that looks in an economy where uh, it's, it's a, a smaller world. Congressman Steve DelBianco with NetChoice. And uh, picking up on your tax point, um, as we move from more, from, from uh, buying goods, tangible goods, to more services, the sourcing question you brought up is going to become paramount. Because if I'm buying a digital service, a download of something I would have ordinarily purchased, it's going to pass through servers in multiple states. And they all claim a piece of the pie, right, for sourcing the transaction. So it's not so much who pays the tax, but who, who gets the revenue. So you talked about income and property taxes, a potential issue. What uh, w would the uh, opponents of that idea suggest that those were more regressive or maybe more, or would you suggest that they're less regressive than a sales tax? I, I think a sales tax is one of the most regressive, regressive forms of tax that we have. Um, and I mean, you know, you look at uh, something like, uh, you could take an example on, you know, the Warren Buffett level, you know, even, even, even my level, there, there's no, there's no way to, we, the, 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 your consumer, uh, your, your consumption of sales taxable goods is in no way commensurate with your income. Uh, you know, I mean, Warren Buffett may very well buy three or four times or even ten times as much uh, taxable goods as, as you or I, uh, but uh, that is completely not commensurate with his income. So the fact that he only pays 17 percent income tax is actually far more progressive than the uh, well under 1% uh, he would pay in sales tax, whereas somebody who's earning thirty dollars or $40,000 a year uh, will pay uh, very close to 5 or 6% of their income in sales tax. Most of their purchases uh, will be items that are um, for the sales tax. For those reasons, uh, those are among the reasons I'm not a fan of sales tax in general. Um, I don't believe overall we have a, a very progressive taxation system. Yes, we have a, a marginal rate. Uh, that is higher for people who earn more money, but sales tax is so regressive that it roughly evens out. And I've seen studies to that effect. Uh, we might have a very slightly progressive system. We might have a slightly regressive system, particularly on the very high end. Um, but uh, sales tax is not only a very complicated way to figure out who gets what in an era where, as you said, something might touch servers in a number of states. Uh, but I don't think it's a, a particularly good way uh, for the economy to grow either to effectively penalize consumption uh, and, 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 and put the burden of taxation on people who have to spend much of their income simply to get by. Well, Congressman, um, thank you for your time today. Um, I want to thank, wish you luck with um, the SOFA debates going forward and everything else you're going to be doing in the Judiciary Committee. And congratulations relatedly on the four month old. I, I have no idea. Congratulations. Thank you. thank you for joining us.
um, the good news is that Congressman had had a lot of time to answer questions, which we were really thrilled about. We thought we'd only have him for a few minutes, so that's that's fantastic. Um, the other news is that we're, we're I'm horribly behind. So um, I want to introduce our next speaker, uh, Craig Craig Moffitt, who's with uh, Sanford and Bernstein and Company. And the bio, Mr. Bio, Mr. Moffitt's bio that's on the website you can all you can all read really doesn't do it the impact. Um, of Mr. Moffitt's research justice. Um, the, he's been a trusted agent for this organization as we've kind of tailored our programming for the congressional audience in our capital briefings you know, for many, many years. Um, he joined um, Sanford in 2002 um, and has been voted the number one cable and satellite analyst in America several times, um, a well-deserved uh, award. Um, prior to that, he spent 11 years with the Boston Consulting Group. Um, he is a major giant on understanding these telecommunications issues when it comes to the new media and, and technology, and we're thrilled to have Mr. Moffitt with us today. Thank you. Okay, so that's right. We, uh, I know we're starting a bit late, so... Um, uh, I, I've got a lot to go through, and I'll go through it fairly quickly, but, um, but I hope uh, that I can simply play the role of setting the stage for the second day of the conference here. Um, just by sharing some, some data, uh, I, I think I have a reputation as, uh, as having what are sometimes controversial viewpoints. Um, and I always find it kind of ironic. I actually don't, I, I try to avoid uh, imposing my personal opinions on any of this. I think the reason that my viewpoints are sometimes perceived to be fairly dramatic is because the microeconomics of the infrastructure business tend to be fairly dramatic microeconomics. That is, they lead to uh, large winners and losers and fairly polarizing outcomes. Uh, and, and I think with that in mind, from a policy perspective, it's helpful just to have the actual data on the table uh, and I will try to share um, what are best estimates for where we are uh, again, this is all focused on the infrastructure side, and I'll focus primarily on the wireline infrastructure. I'll talk about wireless, obviously, but I'll focus primarily on the wireline infrastructure. Um, and let me just start with this, because this is probably the simplest um, place to start. Uh, the, the black line with the dots on it is penetration. Um, so for those of you that can, can see that far to the right-hand axis, um, penetration is around 66% today of Americans, uh, American households with broadband access. Um, this is measured by uh, the, the, the gradations of the bars there are uh, cable, DSL, fiber, and satellite broadband. So again, getting to about 66% of the market. And you can see that the rate of growth um, has slowed, uh, or really slowed sometime around uh, 2008 and, and the beginning of the recession. Um, but it's been fairly steady and it, and it certainly hasn't stopped growing. More interesting probably is this, the adoption curve, um, th that's the same adoption curve on the left that you just saw on the prior page. It's just squished down to half a page width so it looks a little steeper. Um, but more interesting is the chart on the right, which is the incremental change in penetration. As a mathematician, you can usually uh, um, make a fairly good estimate for where a penetration curve is going simply by looking at the point at which an adoption curve or an incremental adoption curve like the one on the right tips over. That is to say, you know, in, in mathematics terms, adoption curves are typically called S curves as they follow the shape of an S and uh, if there happen to be any calculus geeks in the audience. Um, the nature of an S is that it, at the center point it tips over and the second derivative turns, uh, turns negative. Um, and so you can get a pretty good estimate of where something is going by just looking at that point at which it effectively tips over. Between these two charts, you can see it sort of tipped over sometime around um, the third quarter of 2006, uh, beginning of 2007, somewhere in that range. Um, and if you read to the left-hand chart, that puts penetration at some, at the time, penetration was somewhere around 42, 43 percent. And that would say that we're probably heading, again, rough justice, there are things that actually happen that make S-curves imperfect, but that would say that we're headed to somewhere around 85, 86% penetration in the United States of broadband on the current trajectory. Now, there's a lot that happens in, in an S-curve. Um, prices tend to start higher, they get lower. Um, incremental uh, uh, penetration obviously requires penetrating lower and lower income homes. On the other hand, the incremental utility of having broadband service tends to get higher and higher over time as more other people have, have broadband service. 
And so it tends to even out a bit. And, uh, and I think it's not a terrible estimate to say we're on a trajectory for something like 85% penetration. That, by the way, is very interesting because it is, is very close to the penetration of pay TV service in the United States. Um, and, uh, and so we're, we're somewhere in that same range of, of 13 to 15% uh, not having internet service. Um, the reasons for not having broadband, um, obviously one of the main public policy uh, uh, focuses of, uh, of Washington um, and, and a big part of, uh, of the public policy focus of the National Broadband Plan, I guess it was, was it a little over a year ago now, um, are a bit slippery. Um, these, I, I show here two different studies. One is a 2010 study, one is a 2011 study. Um, and I think what's interesting about them is not that it suggests that the reasons for not having internet changed um, a great deal over, over a year, but more that it tells you that the reasons for not having internet have a lot to do with the way you ask the question. Um, and that it is very difficult to pin down the real reasons people don't have internet access. Uh, the largest in the, uh, in the OBI study, uh, this was um, republished by the FCC last year, um, the largest was cost. Um, but cost actually dips down quite a bit in more recent studies. Um, and, uh, and the largest tends to be relevance. And uh, quite, again, quite different answers and would lead you to quite, quite different public policy recommendations um, just based on these two different data sets. Um, but one thing is, now let's, let's switch from the kind of the macro picture to drill down a bit and look at what's happening competitively uh, in the infrastructure. This is what's happening to DSL, and I think um, this probably isn't surprising, but it sets the stage for what I think is a tremendously set of, uh, important set of, of questions about uh, the, the public telephone network. I um, had the privilege of participating in an FCC workshop uh, just about a month ago about the sunset of the PSTN, or the Public Switch Telephone Network. Um, and I think that is going to be uh, a, a debate that's going to be with us for quite a while. And this is one of the reasons. Um, for a long time, probably all of you have seen the data, and we'll look at it in just a second, uh, about the decline of switched access lines, or the traditional <laughs> wired phone line. Um, that was, in some ways, a story about the decline of a single product. I think what you're looking at here is the decline and obsolescence of an entire infrastructure. The copper infrastructure of the telephone companies is increasingly becoming obsolete. Um, and it has very important implications because if, it, it, on the left-hand side of this chart, remember as recently as, as 2006 or so, the telephone companies were already losing access lines um, in their phone business at a very rapid pace, but it was largely being offset by, by very strong growth in DSL to sustain the economics of the copper network. That's simply not the case anymore. Now they are seeing the decline of access lines being compounded by the decline of DSL as well. Um, and that has, again, um, very important implications for, for market share. At the same time, the telephone companies are just about finished building fiber networks. Uh, the, uh, this is net additions um, for, for Verizon Fios, uh, and, uh, and this happens to be focused on video, but the broadband curve for Fios um, looks quite similar. Um, but the, uh, they have just about finished the construction of the Fios project. Um, while they won't come out and say so, I think uh, it is fairly clear that uh, Verizon, that something that we'd said as early as as 2005 and 2006, it is a wonderful network if you're a consumer, but it's a truly awful network if you're an investor. It has been, a, it has been an economic um, debacle to try to build a, a fiber network uh, in, in, even in the Northeast where densities are the highest uh, and, uh, and, and incomes are quite high to support it. It simply has not been a viable project and so Verizon has, has largely shut the door on any incremental expansion of Verizon Fios. And similarly, uh, AT&T's UVerse project, a much lower cost project and a much less ambitious project, uh, but they too are just about finished with the expansion. Um, that too has probably been a, uh, an unattractive investment in terms of investment returns, um, but a much less ambitious one and, uh, and so uh, it, it, probably less important in the grand scheme of, 
uh, of the investment returns that we're seeing here. And I'll return to investment returns at the end because I think in some ways that is the $64,000 question for everybody in the room. And, and it is the role that I try to play most often is trying to remind everybody that public policy has to intersect with investment returns. Because if it doesn't, nothing that you want to see built will ever get built. Um, and this is, uh, this is some data from the FCC uh, on, on speeds. And you can see why DSL is, is rapidly emerging as an obsolete technology. Because DSL on the right-hand side just doesn't deliver the kinds of speeds that customers demand today. Uh, fiber is very good, um, but not terribly widely available. Verizon's Fios uh, is available only to about 14% of the United States. With about 30% penetration rate of that 14%, you're talking about 5.5% or so of the United States with Verizon Fios, not a terribly large number. Um, and, and for the rest of the market, uh, it is primarily cable, and we'll, we'll come to that theme again in a minute. Um, but uh, the cable's average speeds here and the median speeds, the average being the mean and, the, uh, and then the median speeds for cable uh, are, are what is actually sold. Um, technologically, the infrastructure is capable of going to 200 megabits per second or so and probably higher if they allocate substantially more bandwidth to, uh, to broadband. So the cable infrastructure is highly capable um, in terms of broadband and, and this is simply a snapshot of of where we were when this data was measured back in, uh, in 2010. And with that in mind, um, not surprisingly, the competition between the telephone companies and the cable companies is becoming a, uh, a runaway. Uh, the, the top light blue line is the share of net addition, so growth in the broadband market, coming from the cable operators, the green line at the bottom, uh, the growth in the broadband market coming from the telephone companies, um, and as recently as the beginning of this chart, this chart starts, for those of you that can't see the scale because I know it's a little small, starts back in the beginning of 2006. In 2006, they were roughly neck and neck, 50% for each of the telephone and the cable industries. By the end of this chart in the third quarter of 2011, uh, the cable industry was getting uh, about 65 or 66% of the growth in the market um, and, and pulling away, in fact, the, the light black lines that are over later, the quarterly observations, a lot more volatility, obviously, in the quarterly, so we're smoothing them in the, in, in the colored lines. But in the, in the latest observation, the cable operators are getting about 80% of the growth in the market, and it's, it, it looks to us like the telephone companies will, will go to roughly net zero growth um, relatively quickly in broadband as the declines in DSL fully offset the growth that they're getting out of their, their fiber construction. Um, and there's still a lot of room for this story to play out. Um, these are the, the <coughs> charts of the market share of different technologies as of the end of 2010 and where we estimate we are right now or where we were last month. Um, cable has about 60% of the market. It's gained a little bit of market share over the past year, um, something like one point of share um, over the last year. DSL has shrunk, but DSL is still 27% of the market, uh, and all of the fiber technologies together are only about 10. Um, and so DSL is still about three times the size of the telco fiber business, um, and therefore there is more room to fall than there is to grow, probably, for the telephone companies in the broadband business. And this is, a, I think, a quite interesting chart. This is a chart from the FCC that the FCC sent to me. This was in the working papers of the National Broadband Plan. Um, and it shows, you can think of it as a time series, if you will, uh, where the one megabit per second definition of broadband infrastructure uh, shown on the left is roughly, let's say that's where we were about four or five years ago in broadband. The center column is probably roughly where we are today as a country where um, what's required for a broadband connection is about 10 megabits per second. And let's say 25 rough justice again is, is where we're going to be in five, six years or so. Um, the, the focus of a lot of the public policy debate has been about that little black sliver at the bottom of this chart. It has been how do we ensure that uh, that is the not served portion of the, of the United States? How do we ensure that we bring broadband infrastructure to the unserved parts of the country? Um, three to nine percent of the country uh, based on the FCC's estimates uh, that is unserved by broadband infrastructure today. Um, 
But what is equally interesting is what happens to the competitive dynamics as you move from the left-hand side of the chart to the right, where the blue shaded area is the area that is only served by cable infrastructure. Um, and as we move to the right-hand side of the page, the cable infrastructure becomes really the only uh, capable infrastructure in the United States for delivering the kind of bandwidth that consumers are going to require. Now let's think about the telcos for a second and what this, this means for the telcos and for, for the infrastructure that we have come to know and love for the last hundred years. Um, this is uh, a, a look at the access lines. The straight line decline uh, is the access line decline in the United States. Um, the, the green line is the percentage of the industry that is disappearing. Um, and although it has started to decelerate a bit, um, this is still an industry that is in steep secular decline. Um, and I won't drag you through these other than to say these are various regressions of what happens to the unit cost of uh, telephone service cost per line as access lines decline um, in all different states. These are individual state observations over the period of 2004 to 2007. Um, and these are, and they're grouped by category. So the, the upper left hand is Verizon looking at the legacy um, bell states. So in fact, the northeast of the United States. Um, the right hand side uh, of the upper, the upper box is Verizon's old GTE territories. So uh, Florida and Texas and, and California. The bottom are AT&T and divided into legacy SBC and Bell South. Um, all of them have somewhat different cost curves, but all of them say exactly the same thing which should be fairly obvious, but for some reason is controversial. And that is that as access lines decline, the unit costs rise. That is, these are fixed cost businesses. And as the volumes decline, the unit cost that's left over gets spread over a smaller and smaller base. And lo and behold, the cost of each line gets to be higher and higher and higher. This, by the way, should be terrifying for the people that just got through the, un the universal service um, reforms. Um, and I, I've been talking about this for quite a long time. Um, but if you think about the universal service, I've always cast the problem this way, that and you know, now our goal is to, to subsidize even more. Now it's to subsidize broadband as well as um, access lines and, and the basic infrastructure. But again, this is a basic infrastructure problem. Um, and you can think about it as historic, think about it in terms of states. Historically, we've had various states that were net payors into the universal service fund and various states that were net payees from the universal service fund. Um, and the Universal Service Fund obviously covers uh, both rural, but it also covers high cost. Well, we're on a trajectory for every state in the country to become a high cost state. Um, and that raises obvious problems because if you have 50 states that are taking money out of the fund and none of them are putting money in, it's going to be a very difficult problem. Um, and, uh, and we really are headed toward um, a, a very difficult and, and arguably intractable problem as it relates to the copper infrastructure of the United States. Um, this is what's happening to wireline margins at just the big two, Verizon and AT&T. Um, th those may not look all that dramatic, but, uh, but Verizon, in the beginning of 2007, I recall Verizon saying about their wireline margins that uh, as they got through fixing a few things, that their wireline margins uh, over the longer term would go from 28% to between 30 and 35. Um, they targeted their long-term guidance at about 33. Um, instead, they've gone from 28 to 23. Um, and it always struck us as, as uh, rather implausible to think that they would ever go up again. Um, and, and frankly, these estimates, are, what's actually happened isn't far from what we had expected. Um, but, it's, but it's remarkable that people keep expecting that there's going to be some kind of a turn in fixed cost businesses that are rapidly losing volumes. That's what fixed cost businesses that are losing volumes do. They decline. Uh, and so what you're seeing here is, is a very steep decline in, uh, in profitability of these businesses. And that sets the stage for where I want to wrap up, which is what kind of returns are we getting out of this um, industry? Because at the end of the day, uh, at least a theoretician would say that sustained investment in the infrastructure requires that people are earning a return. Um, forgive me if this chart is a bit esoteric, but the, the vertical axis and the, the, the center line is zero, um, so it goes both up and down. 
The vertical axis is the return on invested capital in excess of the cost of capital. So think about that as if you are, for the non-finance people in the room, um, it, you often hear you know, that this company or that company is a profitable company um, as if that is the ultimate litmus test, um, and it really isn't. Um, if I take a billion dollars and put it in a bank account and earn two dollars of interest on a billion dollars invested, I am profitable. Um, I got a profit of two dollars, but that, I don't think anybody would argue that that is an acceptable or, or attractive return. Um, and so the return has to be commensurate with the amount of money that was invested in order to get it. Um, and the cost of capital in these businesses is right around 7.5%. It's actually rather relatively cheap compared to historical um, periods because interest rates happen to be low, so you can borrow cheaply. So at about a 7.5% cost of capital, it means unless I'm earning better than 7.5% return on my money, I'm better off not to invest. I'm better off to just give the money to somebody else and let them do something with it. And so the vertical axis is the spread over the cost of capital. That is, how much more am I making than my cost of capital for the entire decade of the 2000s? By the most generous possible definition, which is I'm going to, ex I'm going to exclude um, anything that is considered unusual, and that is uh, the cost of severance, for example, at um, phone companies that have taken headcount reductions every year for the past 13 years, but call it unusual every time. Um, I'm going to exclude the cost of, or, or the assets associated with what was actually paid for assets that were acquired in the past. That's booked as an accounting concept called goodwill, so over and above the book value of the assets. Um, but I'm still, remember, I'm counting the returns that you get on the assets that you bought. I'm just not counting what you paid to get them, which is obviously an artificial way to look at things. But even through that very, very rose-colored lens, these companies are barely earning, these subsectors of the economy are barely earning their cost of capital. Um, and the, the, the width of the bars um, it, it represents how many, what is the asset pool associated with these businesses. The height is the return relative to the cost of capital. And so the area of those two things, that is how much capital multiplied, multiplied by the return, in effect means what is the economic profit generated by these industries. Collectively, the wireline business through the 2000s actually was the best business in terms of economic profit. Um, that might surprise some people. That's because it started the decade of the 2000s um, pretty well, and it ended pretty badly. Um, and on average, it generated about $22 billion of economic profits through a decade. Um, pretty anemic, given how much money is actually invested in, these, in, in this sector. The wireless business barely earned its cost of capital during the 2000s. It's doing better now, and we'll see that in a minute. Um, prepaid wireless isn't close, so the leaps and metros of the world. Um, cable uh, doing a little bit better in terms of it retur it, its return, um, but still not great. And the satellite business has always been a pretty good return business. The, the real question is whether it's sustainable for a technology that, um, that may or may not have a long-term relevant uh, future. Um, but again, that's through an incredibly rosy set of, of glasses. This is a more appropriate set of glasses, which is let's look at these businesses through um, what I think is, is, is the right way to view them, um, including what they paid for the assets, that is goodwill, and including the unusual items um, which actually do happen to companies and tend to happen on a recurring basis. And collectively, the wired wireless cable and satellite infrastructure through the decade of the 2000s, collectively generated negative $200 billion of economic value through the decade of the 2000s. Let me just let that sink in for a second. This industry collectively generated negative $200 billion of economic value. That is, they destroyed an entire AT&T in a decade. Um, that's, an ex that's an amazing thing to think about when you think about as a backdrop for public policy that this industry is earning just awful returns, just awful returns over the long term. Um, and the picture is not much better um, when you look at them uh, on a subsector basis. Now we'll look at the individual companies. This is the wireline business. Now, now I'm looking at these now on the pure return on invested capital, not on the return on invested capital minus the cost of capital. So you can think about the cost of capital as effectively the hurdle that you have to cross. Verizon's entire wireline business today 
is generating a 1.6% return. So in effect, they're borrowing money at 7.5% in order to get a 1.6% interest rate on it. Um, that is not a good way to make money. Um, AT&T is generating about a 7.2% return on about a 7.5% cost of capital. So they too are losing money, but only a little bit um, on their wireline business. Um, that is in terms of true economic value generated. Again, that's not profits. That's the real economic value being created. Um, the wireless businesses are, as you would expect, better. Um, but remember that these companies are still primarily wireline by, by assets invested. Um, and so Verizon's blended capital, and remember that it only, Verizon as a corporation only owns 55% uh, of its wireless business. People conveniently forget that Vodafone owns the other 45%. Um, on, a, on a proportionately blended basis, that is, you know, what Verizon actually is as a corporate entity, Verizon is not earning its cost of capital. Um, Verizon earns less than its cost of capital. Uh, it, it earns about a 7.4% return with about a 7.5% cost of capital. Um, on a blended basis, AT&T is doing a little better because its wireline business is not nearly as bad as Verizon's is. Um, but these businesses are earning um, pretty anemic returns. The cable industry, um, this is on a different scale. So the cable industry is now earning pretty good returns. Um, again, th these are now, I'm back to looking at these companies through the rosiest glasses again of excluding goodwill and what have you. Um, it's, it's even worse, as you can imagine, uh, if I were to look at them um, in, in the, more, the more sober lens. Um, but the, the cable business is now doing better. But remember, that's after three decades of not earning its, uh, its cost of capital. So it is finally earning its cost of capital after three decades of capital investment, um, and which is good. But it will have to continue to earn returns well above the cost of capital. It's earning about a 25% return. It will have to continue to earn returns above the cost of capital for another couple of decades in order uh, for the initial investments to have been proven wise. And by the way, just for reference, um, it's interesting with SOPA as a backdrop to this discussion. Uh, if I were to put Google and Apple as just two randomly chosen examples, um, their return on invested capital would be well in excess of 100%. Um, and so if you think about the returns that are being generated, um, Google is generating about 100% return on invested capital as it earns its entire asset base every year. Um, and it takes Verizon uh, something like 15 years to earn its asset base. This is, as you can imagine, um, with lousy returns comes lousy stock performance. So I thought I would just throw this in. This is a decade of returns uh, from the stock market for the individual companies that I happen to cover, AT&T, Cablevision, Charter, the, the phone companies, cable companies, satellite operators. The only one with the bars sticking up uh, through the 2000s was DirecTV. Everyone else um, generated negative uh, stock returns during the, during the decade of the 2000s. Um, and this is where we are uh, for today. This is the, the returns for the last full year that's available, 2010. Uh, the return on invested capital minus, um, minus the cost of capital. So again, how, what is the spread relative to the cost of, of capital? Um, the phone industry collectively doesn't generate its cost of capital, um, wireless and wireline combined. Um, the cable industry, again, is, is earning decent returns, um, meaningfully in excess of the cost of capital now. And again, the satellite industry always has, has been a very, very nice return business um, with questions about whether, uh, again, it's sustainable technologically. Um, I won't bore you with this. This is actually the trend of, of these businesses. Other than to say a couple of things, you can see some of them are meandering around. The vertical axis is how fast are you turning over your assets? And the, the right is what kind of margins are you getting? And the, the convergence of those two things represents your return on invested capital. Um, and you can see the, the cable business moving. Most of its uh, improvement is coming from margins getting better rather than from uh, the rate of asset turns getting better. So it's not getting less capital intensive, but its margins are getting better. The wireless business um, has been uh, moving uh, along the same dimension. The wireline business has just been heading straight left, which been falling off a cliff. Um, and then this looks at the individual companies. I think the only thing I would take away from this chart on that same axis is 
all of the sub-industries are actually quite closely clustered with the exception of the wireless business where there are huge, huge differences between the haves and the have-nots. Um, so structurally, there's something meaningfully different going on in the wireless business than there is uh, in the other businesses where there are just AT&T and Verizon are making now quite attractive returns. Everybody has got about the same asset turnover in that business, but the margins are, are completely different for AT&T and Verizon versus everyone else. So I'll leave it there. I just thought I would, I would set that. But again, I think it's so important when you think about the public policy questions. And uh, I, I have been involved in this now for some 20 years or so. I was quite involved in the 96 Act. Uh, and my impression has always been um, that the question of whether the companies that are supposedly being regulated um, are earning a return on capital almost never enters into the discussion. And that's astonishing to me. Um, it ought to be the very first question that enters into the discussion is, is are these businesses able to attract capital and, and are they earning returns that are appropriate um, in order that they can continue to attract capital so that we can get the kind of infrastructure that we as a country want to have. Um, so, you know, we, we talked about penetration. Penetration is clearly slowing, um, but the data suggests that we're probably headed to something like 85% um, <coughs> penetration or so, so we still have a ways to go. Um, it is, I think, too early to ring the alarm bells that says that the have-nots in the internet world are, are being left behind. Um, fiber deployments are just about nearing the end, uh, and telco share is falling that has um, severe implications for what happens to the telco's wired infrastructures and their ability to continue to invest. Cable is clearly winning the broadband wars. Um, but even with that, everyone's returns in this sector um, are, are poor. Uh, I'll stop there and, uh, and thank you all for your kind attention. <laughs> Yeah. One or two questions? Sure. Um, I, you know, when, when someone's on a roll and bring sobering news, you don't want to cut them off. Right. <laughs> so, any questions? And I have one if someone doesn't. Um, oh. So, in your presentation, you mentioned the fact that the, the very uh, capital intensive build out of um, Fios and, and Uberus is almost completed, and that's during the same decade when the returns are low. Could you prognosticate, or is it possible to look ahead and see? whether the returns on that big investment will pay off in future years or decades. Um, so for those of you who couldn't hear the question, I don't know if the mic was actually, was the mic on? Could people yes. hear the question? Yeah. Um, it, it, it's, I think you have to think about a project like that as, as measured by project returns rather than, um, than just aggregate returns um, because there's so much else going on in the wireline business. There's enterprise and, and consumer and, and what have you. On a project return basis, our estimate is that, that over the lifetime of the project, um, Verizon's Fios will have generated about negative $1,700 per subscriber. Um, uh, it, 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 remember, this is a business that it, it's costing them um, about $1,000 per home passed. Um, but, but you have to pass all the homes in order to get market share, so if you get uh, their, their own estimate is 40% market share um, will be connected to the network. So uh, $1,000 divided by 40% is $2,250. Um, and then uh, on top of that, you have set-top boxes and the rest of the connection costs, the drop and what have you. The, the total cost of the Verizon Fios project is about $4,000 per connected home. To put that in perspective, when they decided to build Verizon Fios, the cable infrastructure was trading in the public capital markets at about $1,200 per connected home. So in effect, what Verizon said to its board of directors was, we think once there's two of these networks um, competing head to head with each other, they'll be worth three times as much as they are when there's only one. Um, that's an extraordinarily difficult argument to make. Right? Uh, Mr. Moffitt, yeah. I have another question back here from, for Adam there. If you could, yeah. um, in, after Adam asks the question, um, if you could just quickly um, Answer, in the Telecom Act of 1996, could you just answer really quickly um, after Adam's question, what you thought was sure to work and failed horribly? Okay. Well, that was my question. <laughs> uh, it's partly my question, because Craig, um, the, depending on who you talk to here in Washington when they see a, hear a presentation like this, 
they would say that the, the Telecom Act did fail and that we needed a different model, or at least we do now, and they'd spin some of this news to say, well, look, isn't this mean that broadband's a monopoly and that we need something like a postal service model for it uh, to allocate uh, these resources to all those who uh, need high-speed uh, digital networks? So what did we get wrong or what do we need to do going forward to get it right? Um, yeah, so uh, I'm going to just, I have to think for a second to decide whether I want to go down that path because I, I try to avoid um, making policy recommendations because I think to the extent that I am an analyst and my role is as an analyst, I actually try to, to not make policy recommendations. I try to simply provide analysis and I try to predict what will happen rather than what I think should happen. Um, uh, but uh, suffice to say um, that, that I think it is extraordinarily difficult to pretend that you can provide incentives to build a second um, infrastructure when the, when the underlying economics don't support a second infrastructure. You know, and I, I, I long ago I wrote um, a, a piece uh, that, that uh, I owe actually the concept to a friend of mine who was on a panel and, um, uh, and a woman named Jonna Johnston uh, was talking about the New York subway system. And so I went back and I did some, some research on the history of the subway system as an infrastructure project. It was really a fascinating one um, where people forget that the New York City subway system was actually a set of competing for-profit enterprises uh, during the 19-teens up through the 1930s, competing for the privilege of bringing passengers into New York City. Of course, they all went bankrupt during the uh, Depression and got municipalized, um, but some of our grandparents still remember the IRT, the BMT, and, and, uh, and that sort of thing. And, and, but I, it, you, it, there's some very interesting lessons from the subway system, and I, I ended that research um, report with a set of, of rhetorical questions about, you know, if you went to someone today and said, I'm going to build a second S train between Grand Central Station and Times Square, and I'm going to dig a second tunnel, and I'm going to run a second train, and now we're going to have two S trains compete based on which one offers better schedules and cleaner rails and, 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 uh, and more comfortable, better lighting and what have you. I think most people would be sober enough to say that's one of the worst ideas they'd ever heard. So why did we think it was such a great idea to build a second pipe into every home and then only turn one of the two of them off? <coughs> Didn't we realize that that was going to, in effect, lead to twice as much cost per home as, uh, as an alternative model? Now, the, the competitive model has wonderful benefits, um, but it isn't always applicable. And I think one of the real challenges for economists in trying to figure out what the right answer is, and this is a global question, is what we're seeing here in a lot of these industries, let, much less so the wireless industry. Um, the wireless industry has very different microeconomics that I won't get into, but the, the wireless industry does not lend itself to, micro, to, to natural monopoly economics in anywhere near the same way that the wired industry does. Um, but the wired industry was understood to be a natural monopoly from, uh, from 1913 and the Kingsbury commitment all the way until 1984. Um, and since 1984, we've had wonderful bursts of innovation uh, and, and uh, capital investment and job creation out of deregulating the phone business. But we've also had catastrophic um, consequences. And it's, it's very hard to determine what, what kind of cycles you're looking over. Over the very short term, the benefits of deregulation of, of telecom, and this gets to the question before about what happened out of the Telecom Act. You know, it, it, the brief history lesson is remember that the backdrop for writing the 96 Act was that deregulation of the long distance market in 1984, and really 83, 84 with the, with the Big Bang, was wonderfully successful um, for the first 10 years. Um, you had job creation, you had falling prices, elasticity of demand sucked up all of that, uh, of that uh, price decline and then some almost um, self-evidently good for GDP because you reduced friction costs of doing business. So the deregulation of long distance looked absolutely wonderful for the first 10 years, which is when Congress sat down to write the 96 Act um, in around 94 or so. In effect, to say, let's capture that same magic and do it to the local, do to the local exchange what we did to the long distance market. Not realizing that five years later, every long distance company in America would either be in or on the way to bankruptcy. 
right? In effect, what we've done is we've done the same thing to the local exchange. And now, lo and behold, 15 years after the act, Verizon's entire wireline business is earning less than zero. Uh, it is losing money, and if Verizon's wireline business were a standalone enterprise, it would probably already be bankrupt. Um, it, it is very difficult to fight the natural microeconomics of these businesses, and, and I will just leave it at that. Um, if you try to create regulatory outcomes and pick winners and losers, um, you will create temporarily um, certain potentially much desired outcomes like capital investment, job creation, um, but with enormously negative consequences over the long term. Well, Mr. Moffat, thank you so much for coming. We really appreciate it. Thank you.